Welcome and thank you for supporting tonight's lecture in the Barbados Museum and Historical Society annual lecture series. My name is Winston Moore and I will be the chair for tonight's proceedings. I would like to acknowledge our sponsors and thank them for their continued support. The 2019 lecture series is hosted by the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, um, but the University of West Indies Department of History and Philosophy also lends support, as well as the Nas National Cultural Foundation, um, with support from the Barbados Trailway Project. Tonight's topic, only five years, challenges of return and reintegration of Barbadians and migrated of Barbadians who migrated to the United Kingdom during the 1950s to 1970s is a particularly relevant topic in many ways. As economists, um, you would expect me to provide you with some stats in regards to this issue, right? Um, we tend not to have really good statistics on persons returning to Barbados and the amount of monies they're, they're coming back with, but you can sort of look at the, the balance of payments and get a really interesting idea of how much money they're uh, bringing into the island in terms of the pension statistics. So in any given year, uh, pensions um, received by Barbados tends to be between one to two million dollars per year. Um, so that's foreign exchange that we're earning just from the pensions of these persons that are coming back from overseas. Now, this, uh, this number is a little bit understated because it doesn't uh, include persons that might have worked in the private sector. Uh, the pensions of persons captured in the private sector is not um, broken out in the balance of payment statistics. And in, in addition to that, the, uh, the significant savings that persons would have um, built up living overseas, as well as the other assets that they're bringing back to Barbados are not adequately captured in, um, in the statistics in any given way as well. So in addition to these financial benefits, however, the re return migration also poses significant challenges in relation to reintegration into society that wealth similar has now evolved from one that they left. This can be a source of frustration for persons who would have spent most of their working lives dreaming of returning home. Tonight's speaker is well placed to interrogate these issues. Mr. Kenneth Walters is a postgraduate sociology student at the University of the West Indies, Cafield campus, focusing on the issue of return migration. He's also the campus registrar of the University of the West Indies, Cafield campus, but he has significant experience in the area of human resource management, working in this area for over 25 years. Ken, I'm going to age you, right? Uh, he his responsibilities at the University of West Indies is sort of like a catch-all for almost everything. He is in charge of areas in relation to undergraduate student admissions, examinations, graduate studies, student records, records management, human resource management, student banner unit, maintenance services, and he still finds time to sleep as well. <laughs> and so in addition to his distinguished university career, he also has worked with, with, within the public sector as a senior labor officer, but he's done a lot of work within the private sector. Within the private sector, he was head of the human resources and administration at Cable and Wireless Barbados, manager of employee relations at Scotia Bank in, in its regional office, and manager of human resources at Courtesy Garage Barbados. Given his long and distinguished career in the area of human resources, you can therefore see why he's more than able to speak on tonight's topic. Ladies and gentlemen, well, please welcome Mr. Kenneth Walters. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, thank you, Mr. for that introduction. I actually started to look at this whole topic of return migration um, almost 20 years ago when I worked in the Labor Department um, because that was the agency which was mandated by government to actually processed persons who were going off to the UK at the time. Um, while I was working there, I came across the records of those persons who were recruited. And I actually got a, a, a couple of youth service students to actually collate them for me, so I can pull the data from them, basically. And I have been keeping that data for a while until I actually applied to do the postgraduate degree at the, at the university. And it has been a long process because um, I got 
basically caught up in a, a project which was started at university around the same time that I, I joined them, um, the Oral History Project, which basically was a project to capture the voices of persons who had migrated and basically record their stories um, at that time. I was brought in as the research assistant. Um, at that time, the project was actually being done by uh, Professor uh, Woodville Marshall, who was head of the history department at the time, and Dr. Phillips, Dr. Marcy Bowers, Dr. Avson Dongs, and I were the four persons who were charged with making the, the project become a reality. So we got involved in this, this process of interviewing persons. Uh, we actually interviewed about 30 people for the project itself, and those 30 people uh, were all migrants um, who had returned, who had retired, returned, and came back to Barbados to live. Um, we also were able to have questionnaires done with the various groups of returning nationals as well, and basically had them fill out questionnaires related to their experience on return. But we also captured information on their experience while they were in the UK as well. So it was a, a, a very full body of information that we gathered from these interviews and from these questionnaires. And what I'm going to share with you this afternoon relates to what were some of the outcomes from that, that uh, process as part of my, my study, basically. All right, my research question uh, for my study is, was basically are returning Barbadian nationals from the United Kingdom able to positively reintegrate into the Barbadian community and society. Uh, this was asked because over the years we've had a number of people indicating that they had challenges uh, making the adjustment when they returned. And therefore we felt that we needed to have some um, study done to really get the data and the statistics to indicate whether there were real challenges or whether these were imagined challenges. And the study will basically show you the extent to which these persons have actually reintegrated within the Barbadian society and community. Just to give you some statistics, um, Bill Chamberlain estimated that there were about 27,000 Barbadians who migrated between 1955 and 1971. Um, she would not have captured those who migrated before 1950-55 are those who migrated after. So we can use that number for the time being as, as what, what it is. Um, government statistics show that 10,000 migrants were processed through the employment exchange, and there were, there are no about 67,000 persons of Barbadian origin in the UK. Maybe Guy can confirm that for me as the night goes on, <laughs> but that is what we had found at the time that we already started the research. And the middle states control as much as 10,000, 10 million, sorry, to foreign exchange earnings annually. Persons who returned, um, the totals that we had in the census at the time would have been about 7,000. And that, that number fluctuates because people come and they go, and they come and they go. And therefore, it may uh, sometimes be more than that, and at times it may be less than that. And in the study itself, we found that there were a number of people who actually died during, after we had completed the interviews. And, and therefore, these may have the um, subtracted from the number. But I also got some additional statistics um, in terms of retinacies. Um It was interesting because I found that there were different statistics from different agencies basically indicating what, what the numbers were. Um, this one, I think the World Bank study, they showed the average value for Barbados during the period um, 1987 to 2013 was $55.87 million, uh, with a minimum of $70.65 million U.S. dollars in 1987, and a maximum of $100.2 million U.S. dollars in 2001. So the numbers are pretty significant in terms of uh, what remittances we got from that. And this was from the Advocate newspaper in 2008. Um, Barbers received 9.4% of the GDP in remittances during 2006. And the estimated US 2.292 million was pumped in the economy during 2006 from Barbadian migrants living abroad. That doesn't say the UK only, but abroad generally. So they, there's a good reason to look at return migration because there's substantial benefits we get as an economy from, from these remittances um, which the migrants bring back. 
just to give you a, a nice picture here of, of Sierra, the old Sierra Airport, uh, when people left Barbados, and you'll find all the young ladies who are going off to be nurses in the UK, going out to the um, BOAC, um, just at the time, <laughs> to travel up to the UK. Um, we, we, we've titled this series of lectures, The Windrush, Genera Windrush Generation. But a lot of the Barbadians who left here actually went on the Sorrento um, as opposed to the Windrush. The Windrush. Um, because the Windrush would have traveled from Jamaica upward. Um, but we had the Italian ships traveling from Barbados to Italy, basically, uh, dropping off people. And then they came back down from, uh, from Italy to UK. So they're, they're different. Um, pathways towards the UK by different groups. When one looks at the migration theories, one can see why people would have determined to move. Um, the major one that people tend to look at critically is the push-pull factor. Um, because people are pushed to do particular things because of certain circumstances, and they're pulled to do things because of those circumstances as well. Um, you'll find that because of the economic situation in Barbados at the time, uh, which we had high levels of poverty, you had difficulties with housing, um, salaries were low, jobs were far, far and few in between. You find that people basically um, decide that they need the opportunity to move to improve their economic lot. Um, so it was a response to population pressure, to lack of economic opportunities, to political change, or to the promise of a better life. Then the other series is look like at the household network or transnational communities that explains why entire villages appear to move or to facilitate movement of others. So you'll find that in some cases, and when we look at the statistics, there were a, a whole lot of people coming out of the, the rural parishes who made that trip to the UK. Um, and that was interesting because at the time, they, they had less opportunity to get jobs in the city, for example. And therefore, they felt it was better for them to basically travel to the UK to find a better, a better life for themselves. Then we have the, the third theory, the historical structural theory, which explains why people basically from developing countries move to industrial companies in that, in, in that the, the national economic system siphons off cheap sur surplus labor from the periphery to the main the factories of the metropole. So you find that. The attraction basically would have been encouraged to some extent by the, the British. The British had a shortage of labor at the time, and therefore they felt it necessary to try to attract cheap labor basically from the, from the region. And, and they found it easy to, to basically siphon off as much of our um, skilled, semi-skilled labor as possible to meet their needs at that particular point in time. There's also the public policy theory that suggests that, that, our absence, that laws or the absence of a clear enforceable policy can encourage, discourage, or divert flows of people. And, and because we generally don't have any laws prohibiting migration, everybody who left Barbados to go to UK felt they were part of the, English, the British Empire. And therefore, they felt they had a right to go. And there, were, there was a perception that there was a significant amount of wealth that could be had in the UK. And therefore, they, they made that trek, looking for some of that wealth. Um, and our governments didn't have any real reason to stop people from going. I think, to some extent, they encouraged it. If you remember, Mr. Crawford, at the time, was the person who was mandated by the government to basically recruit persons for the British, British labor market. Melch, in looking at return migration, makes analysis of the typologies. Um, and basically had these, these typologies. One, returnees who intended temporary migration. The time of their return is determined by the objectives they set out to achieve at the time of migration. And that's why, why, why the topic is only five years. I think most people left with the intention of coming back to Barbados. They felt that they could have earned enough in that five years to be able to come back reasonably wealthy. I think some of them were looking at the people who would have gone to, to Panama, for example, who would have done extremely well in terms of earnings, spent a period of time, and came back to Barbados and, and either bought properties, start businesses, or basically develop um, some mechanism to which they could earn additional income. 
Then the second typology was returnees who intend to permanent migration but who were forced to return and their preference would remain aboard, but because of external factors, they were required to return. And there would have been some of those. Some persons got ill, some persons did not um, find the sorts of jobs that they wanted. And if you, if you follow the, the, history, the history, basically, of the process, you'll find that people who left Barbados as pretty skilled people went to the UK and had to work at low paying jobs. So the choices of the jobs that they were looking for in some cases never, never materialized. And that was a challenge to some people, so some of them did basically decide to return um, as soon as they could. And then we have the ones who intended permanent migration but chose to return because of failure to adjust or homesickness led to their decision to return. And there were those who also had, would have had that as a problem in terms of return. It is a time of hope and looking at the characteristics of, and the implications of Caribbean return migration still that migration was a means of extending the island opportunities and circumventing the constraints of work mode mobility imposed by the system at home. I think a lot of people would have left Barbados because they felt there was the opportunity to, to improve their circumstances. And therefore, they would have gone to UK with the intention of earning at a certain level, improving their conditions over time, and being able to re return to Barbados of a, of a higher status. I think essentially that is what a number of people left to do. Uh, because some of them would have been at the lower end of the socioeconomic bracket. Um, some of them might have had some training in specific areas like nursing, and working as artisans, um, but the majority would have been unskilled to some extent, but they took the opportunity to go to the UK to work on London transport in those places. It was also seen as the acknowledgement of avenue of self-advancement, upward mobility, and establishing oneself and family in an improved situation back home. So ideally, they were looking to make the best of the opportunity to improve their circumstances. A number of persons left children here when they left. And therefore, they were seeking to earn enough to also send back money for those children. Um, also, over time, they were earning and sending back funds, basically, to, to build homes so that when they decided to come back, there was a home to come to. They were supporting siblings. They were supporting parents. They also had to pay, basically, to cover the cost of their, their transport to go to UK. Remember, a lot of people had to get loans huh, um, to go to UK, so therefore, they had to earn we pay, we pay those loans to the government or to individuals. Um, I know in some cases people borrowed money from um, neighbors and that sort of thing in order to go to UK. So therefore they still had to find ways of, of paying back those funds um, so that they could continue to, to basically do what they had to do. The varieties of return migration, according to Thomas Hall, are transient or shadow. Migrants who consisted of international vendors, contract workers, other inter itinerant labor migrants and business communities, commuters, dependent students, and long-term circulation. So there's a pretty wide range of, of, of migrants that one sees within the process. Um, a lot of our people might have been temporary in the sense that their perception of, of their journey would have been a short one. Didn't turn out that because a lot of them left in the 20s and they came back in the 60s. So it's a pretty long <laughs> temporary process for a lot of them. Um, but they were prepared to make those sacrifices to achieve what it is that they wanted. So in terms of what we were doing in terms of um, developing the study, we were using a mixed method, methodology basically. One, we were using qualitative um, analysis as well as quantitative analysis. The Oral History Project basically allows us to capture a very rich source of information about those persons who migrated. Um, when you sit and interview some person who has gone, gone away for 20, 30 years, 40 years, uh, they have a story to tell. And therefore, the project was to capture that, that story in as vivid and as detailed a, a manner as possible. I had transcripts that were about 60 pages in some cases because you were talking about the experience when you left Barbados, why you had to leave, what the experience was in terms of um, the process of getting there. Some people travel by boat, um, some people travel by plane. And in some cases, the, the, the boat trips were like um, some of the slave trips that brought people here from Africa because people were kept down in the hole basically while they traveled to the UK. And the conditions weren't that, that good for some people. 
Um, in fact, it was stories that, that women were sometimes raped in, in some of those holes in those ships where they were going to the UK. So the, the conditions weren't that good. But we used the oral history methods, all the structured interviews, the key respondents, or they recorded them, and transcribed them, analyzed the information, digitized and stored them. They're basically stored at the university um, and the faculty of humanities at the stage. Um, we, we kept those 30 interviews, um, both in terms of cassette recordings and digital formats, and all of them have transcriptions attached to them. So we could, trans we could uh, extract information from the transcriptions that have been used. I also use survey questionnaires. We've got expert views from some sociology returnees. Then we have um, survey questionnaires on members of return national organizations. And qu the questionnaires were structured questionnaires to be completed in groups or on an individual basis, and response were then analyzed. So it was a quite comprehensive process of, of collecting data um, from those persons that we were engaging. These are some of the groups that we were able to reach during that exercise. Um, these are not all the groups, um, but basically they were spread across Barbados. But they were, they, everyone was interested in sharing the information. I think that was, that was important. Um, every group I went to basically was prepared to do the questionnaires, and therefore they completed them. Um, some of them were not completed properly or uh, completely, but we got some information we could work with. Um, these are the complete listing of all the the groups that now exist in Barbados. Um, and this was captured both the, sorry. This was captured both the ones who are related to the UK and those who are something multi, multicultural because some people from the US also became members of some of the groups as well. But they're, they're pretty active groups um, and they have been involved in a number of different activities while they have been in Barbados, basically. You have groups which uh, meet at Oysteins uh, every morning at the beach. Um, and some days they have their get-togethers. Um, there's a lady that provides the meals for them and that sort of thing. Um, there are groups, one of the groups that travels overseas as well as part of an annual event. And there's a group that has a choir. So they, 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 these groups have emerged in a very positive way. And one can almost understand where these groups form because these were people who had a common interest coming to the UK. And therefore, they were drawn to each other, each other in terms of support. And when they show the, the remainder of this presentation, you see why they need that support. Because in a lot of cases, they didn't have any support to, to rely on on their, on their return here. In terms of the research completed date, we had 27 oral history reviews completed. There were 13 males and 14 females. 75 survey questionnaires were issued, 63 returned. Uh, 59 completed, partially completed, and fully completed, 29 males, 24 females. So it was a, a mix of persons in those groups uh, who were able to, to reach. The types of jobs that people migrated to would have been nurses, um, student nurses, hospital auxiliaries, bus drivers, conductors in the London transport, train drivers in London and the ground, hotel workers in various hotels, job workers, canteen workers, artisans, cotton workers, maids and laundry workers. So it's a, a wide, pretty wide mix of areas in which people had migrated to work in. Um, because remember, the, the population of, of England would have been almost decimated after the Second World War. So there was a, a big need for, for people to come and provide um, the support for their industries and whatever. Policemen and soldiers also went um, to work in the British Army and that sort of thing. And these are agencies which people were migrated to, the British Transport Commission, And this is, this is a group of persons who are actually in the UK now, um, close to a bus, a London transport bus. And they're, they're quite comfortable there and there. So there we get the analysis now, um, which is the interesting part of this whole process. Um, basically, persons were saying that they went for five years. Like I said already, the majority left in their 20s and returned in the 60s. And most of them came back after they actually retired, as opposed to uh, coming back before that um, because they felt they needed to come back and do something else in Barbados. And they actually waited until they had a settled position and they were able to come back and sustain themselves in Barbados. And they made sure their children were grown and, and educated and whatever it's in the UK before they actually came back to Barbados as well. Personal reached the age of retirement, there was a double taxation treaty 
agreement between the UK and Barbados. And that was critical for a lot of people because they didn't want to be taxed twice when they repatriated their funds to Barbados. Right, so they were happy that they basically were not um, impacted on by the levels of taxation, which would have been um, difficult for them to, to manage on the pensions that they were getting coming back. There were also the provisions of, of concessions by government for retired nationals as well. Um, and this was an important one because persons then had then have the, the costs of paying all those duties when they came into the ports. Um, they didn't have to worry about if they brought back a car, there were concessions on those. If they brought back household effects, there were concessions on those. Um, so generally, they, they were beneficiaries of that government policy to encourage persons to come back and invest in Barbados. I'm not sure how much of investment we got. Uh, maybe, um, Vincent, you can tell us if you have any, for any particular investment done by the group. But one of the issues that came through as well is the bad renters. Um, I think people from our environment tend not to deal with the cold <laughs> very well after a period of time. Um, I studied in, in the UK at Manchester for two years, and I found that the first winter wasn't bad because it was new. It was, it was a new experience to some extent, but the second one affected me badly. I got a bad cold and that sort of thing. So I think when people from our climates live in these environments, after a while, the cold gets to you. I think a number of people said that they had had enough, basically, and they wanted to get home to a warmer environment to retire. And therefore, that was also a factor in terms of making that transition back to you. The only five years, and these are some extracts from some of the persons who were interviewed. Interesting one, the first time when I got on the plane and I knew it was coming back for good, I felt really good. Sad in a sense, but I knew well, that's it. You feel bad because you're leaving your kids behind as well, but I knew it was coming back to Barbados, some place that they always wanted to be anyway. I didn't know when it was going to, but I always have a vision that if God give me health and whatever, I want to come back. So I must, I just made it back and I thank God for that. There's some migrants who we, who we interviewed who didn't want their names, um, provided in any presentation we were doing or in the book that we are seeking to publish at the end of this process. And therefore, we gave her the title Migrant B. There are others who didn't have a problem with it, so we had their surnames attached. Um, there's another one. Because what I wanted, I get, and I come home with ain't it. I went to get something better, and you get something better, and then you return to your country, ain't it? And as you work up there, you work to get it to old age, what you're waiting up there for, there's nothing up there when, for you now, after. On my land, there's nothing more for you up there. You work and you put in your pension money. I don't see why you can't come home and enjoy it in the sun. That was Miss Warner. Um, and she worked in um, the hotels at one point. Um, um, this is another migrant. Five years and I stayed 40, that was the thing, the first. Five years come around so fast. You now you put through your five years already. You know, I always let tell you, oh man, I go up there for five years. Not one more, and it end up being 40. Right? So you see the, the reality that people face. Your man died, your lady died, and I was up there, but I had always decided anytime I hit 40, 60 years, I'm not staying up there any longer. If I live to 60 in London, but, but by the time I'm 60 in two months, I got to be down here. That was. Scott, he's, a, he's one of those persons who, interestingly, was able to integrate quite easily back into Barbados. Um, I remember he telling me that he used to go down Moontown on Friday nights uh, down by Kelly and have his beers and, and relax and have a good time, eat some good food and things. And he didn't have a problem. His wife came and went, came and went, uh, but he stayed. And he, he settled very easily back into the, the life in Barbados. Again, only five years. This is Martindale. Yes, five years. None of us come back in five years. In five years, you're just getting yourself started. Because the Barbados government, you had to pay that back. And then you had to eat. You had to get the clothing to suit the weather and whatever. But I was going to spend five years, and I returned on the 20th. That's the 20th of 2080, I think it was, she came back. Right? So she had a long, a long run in that process. And there's another one. I always said I'm only going to stay here for five years until that passport ran out and I go home. I ain't stopping here no more. And then 40 years later, that, that was it. I always wanted to come home. I always told the children, the youngest girl, when you are 21, I'm going home and I'm going home. 
It didn't work with that way, but you know, nothing happens before the time. But we had an opportunity to build a house here, and we did. Fortunately, we did it then, and we have been happy since we came home. We had hiccups like everybody else. Right, so she's being realistic about the, the transition. And that, that basically those are the, the examples which um, emphasize the point that people said they went for five years. Nobody achieved that goal because the reality of it is when you go to a foreign country, you're gonna find you have to make these major adjustments. You have to basically seek to fit into the environment you're working in and basically adjust to housing conditions and those things. And that, that was the reality that most of them faced and therefore couldn't come back in the five years that they had envisioned. Some of the things that push, push Barbadians back home are also important to look at. Um, housing was not the highest quality, having to share rooms, bathrooms, outdoor toilets, heating costs, racism as a barrier to getting accommodation. These are some of the issues that people face when they, when they migrated. Um, I think some of you can relate to this now that we have people migrating to Barbados and we are quick to to develop a, a level of xenophobia <laughs> because we don't want them here. Um, we've had the Guyanese, which we kind of push out. Um, but in those, they, do the same, they did the same things here that the Barbadians did when they went to the UK. They shared rooms, and we've had the instances where, where the Guyanese were sharing rooms, a whole family would come and, and live in one little bedroom. But Barbadians had to live that life in order to survive in the UK. They had to basically, um, do three, four, five in the room sometimes in order to survive. They had the bathrooms conditions were not something as good as we had in Barbados when they left. Um, but that was the conditions they had to live under. Um, heating costs was something they had to contend with because they had to make sure that they didn't freeze to death in the bad, the bad weather conditions. And racism was also a barrier in terms of getting good accommodation. There's a case um, basically where a lady had to sue a uh, uh, landlord because when she went to get the apartment and the landlord saw who she was, she told her no, that is no longer available. So she sent back one of her friends for the same apartment and the person got it, who was a white person. And she sued them. She actually won the case, but she never got the compensation. <laughs> So she actually sued, sued somebody for, for uh, treating, discriminating against her because of her, her risk. Won the case, but never got the compensation. Employment was a challenge in two, two senses. Getting some type of jobs as a black person, the conditions a person faced on the jobs. Um, especially nurses in, in particular. Nurses had, had a major challenge in terms of working in, in hospitals with white people. Um, the cases where people said it was spot on. Um, they don't want to be touched, and, and, and they refuse to allow the, the, the black nurse to deal with them. So there was that high level of discrimination that, that our people had to face in those circumstances. And maybe one can understand why, why that, um, the responses that they, they developed to those circumstances might have caused them to behave in a different way when they came back. Um, because I always say that if you are faced with particular stimulus, basically they're gonna cause you to behave in a particular way. And our people had a lot of major challenges when they went to the UK in order to make a better life for themselves. Racism was also a big, big factor in there. Interestingly enough, a lot of people, when they related about racism within you, except for the lady who had discrimination case, they tend to talk about racism to other people. So it was never something that happened to me. It might happen to my children but it's about happiness to somebody else. And some of you feel that is a, a, a repressed memory to some extent, because people would have been facing this as a, a matter of course in their, their, their processes. You heard of cases where um, people were working on the buses and basically the white people refused to hand the, want to touch the, the hand of the conductor who's collecting the fear. So it was, it was blatant racism to some extent within those, those environments. So that's something that we, we have to, recognize when we, when we see our people um, respond in particular ways when they come back. So when they came back um, within this environment, we found that a few people returned to their original housing location, or even parish, right? I call that no naval swing linkages, basically. Um, you leave Barbados living in St. Patrick's, Christchurch, 
and you come back, and there's no room in the end because when you come back at 60 years old, the other, tri the other siblings basically have taken up all the property and built houses on and that sort of thing. So you've got to go and look to live in a develop, developed area. So that the linkages were lost as the communication tended to not have been consistent during those periods. Um, sometimes the only communication was that they sent sending back bars or they sent sending back postcards or something. But generally, there was an absence of returning to those family linkages very important. Where your navel string is buried is very critical to your own identity. And that is, that is critical. When people are, are no longer able to build those relationships within their communities that they would have left, they would have challenges integrating back into the society. Um, they had also, also had to build new lives as returnees as 90% of those surveyed returned to new locations. Right, so everybody coming back in did not return to the family plot, basically. It was finding another location in order to make a, make a living for themselves. And, and that, that created its own challenges in terms of the linkages with people. Um, Interesting enough, the, the other element of that was that the same family that they would have sent um, Barrows to and Rebidences to when they were there, when they came back and those Rebidences stopped, the relationship changed to some extent. Because the value had changed at that point for, for the people who had remained. And therefore, they sometimes felt that they were no longer as important to the people who they had sometimes sacrifice to provide these things for. You would have people in the UK spending a year accumulating stuff to send back to family and sacrificing the, 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 their own needs to some extent. But when they actually came back to Barbados, you found that the people who they sacrificed for no longer value them. And therefore, they had a difficulty sometimes dealing with that. And some relationships did not flourish because of those circumstances. There's one lady who told me that she had allowed her grandson to, to stay in her house when it was finished before she came home. And basically, when she came home, he had run up all these bills and that sort of thing, and she had to then find ways to cover those costs. But she also had to ask him to leave because he wasn't prepared to contribute to the cost around the house. And then when she wanted some assistance, she found that he would also ask her to put gas in care. So the challenge that, that she would have had is that, here I assisted you for all these years I was overseas, and now I come back. I asked to get a drop to church, a drop to the hospital, a drop to the supermarket. And each time, I got to find $10 or $20 to give you to put some gas in care. So the relationships that with family broke down to some extent when those, those relationships changed. Um, from the person sending back the... And therefore, they perceived they were not treated as valued members of the society. They did not have support systems um, to help them, basically, in things that they needed to do. And this occurred because a lot of people came back and their children did not come back. Or the children did not see themselves as Barbadians. They saw themselves as British Barbadian because of the parentage but they did not necessarily see themselves as Barbadian, Barbadian. While the parents who were purebred Barbadians came back and they felt their kids should come, the children would come and visit, spend a couple of weeks, and go back. And you find then the, the parents after a while also having to go back because in order to keep that contact and maintain that relationship, they had to go back to the UK, spend some time, and then come back. So you had those, those that... that um, kind of dislocation occurring on a continuous basis for the individuals who want to come back and stay, but didn't have the support system around them to deal with that. And there was also the, the question of perceived discrimination. Um, I assure all of you have heard the comments made about the returning Barbadians from the UK. Um, and the, the, Barbie, the, the, the persons returned also heard those comments, and therefore they felt they was being discriminated against because they were being seen as different, um, although they still perceived themselves as Barbadian. 
And that, that kind of hurt a lot of them when we look at the, the interviews that we did. So a lot of them had to uproot themselves from the, their families established in the UK in order to return. Some of their children did not return uh, with them, but basically visited when they could. And some of their children did not see themselves as Barbadians. But some of them went back for medical, medical care as well, because they would also say that the, the care in the UK was better than in Barbados. So they made a choice to go back to, to get um, that medical um, treatment. But, um, also to shop or to visit their friends because they, they were building new friendships in Barbados and in some cases trying to retain the old friendships because of the association with various groups that were formed. Those are not return national groups. I made the point earlier that most of the migrants came from every part, you know, equal amounts of the exceptions to Michael which had the land share. So you had a spread across the rural parishes basically. <laughs> Um, so you had people coming in large numbers from, especially the northern parishes, huh? St. Lucie and St. Peter and those, those areas. Um, but when they came back, they returned to four parishes in large numbers. St. Michael, 22%. St. James, 18%. St. Philip, 15%. Christ Church, 70%. Right, so the majority sell in these particular parishes, as opposed to going back out to St. Lucie or St. Peter or St. Andrew, where they originally came from. Only a very small percentage that returned to the parish or village they originated from. And so you see the, the missing linkages, the naval string linkages would have been lost because you're not maintaining those contacts with your families basically when you return. Um, my brother also migrated to the UK and I think when he came back, he also went and, and lived in a developed area. But he would still come and visit the old lady every Saturday, and we would, we would meet and have some pudding sauce or cooking sauce or fish or whatever. Um, so he tried to maintain his linkages. Um, but generally, people tended to move out of the environment and move towards um, developed areas. And basically, for the majority of them, they were starting new lives. They came back to an environment which they believed that they knew. But they actually had to start new lives in it. Because if they built a house and developed the area, they then had to build relationships with their neighbors, basically, in those environments. And that was difficult sometimes, because um, I find all people in developed areas are not that embracing to some extent. Um, they, don't, they don't reach out to, to new people coming in. And they make judgments of people very quickly who come into the environment. I know because I, I lived in two developments, <laughs> and each time people made judgments about me, which didn't <laughs> accord with my own characteristics. But people do that. And maybe it's a Barbadian thing, but we, we make very quick judgments of people based on our own perceptions of how people behave and that sort of thing. Uh, and sometimes these, these people would have felt like virtual strangers in those developments. Um, I think we had, we had a couple in Lowlands who we tended to embrace when it was living in Lowlands, but I think you'll find a lot of them felt that there was nobody really reaching out to, to um, embrace them and get them involved in what was happening in the community. I did some of the extracts again from the old history. Um, this was Mildred. She was my f the first person I ever interviewed in this process. I said, the only regret I have is now I come back. I thought my family would be living nice. And one of her, I think, cousins, uh, Warner. I don't like mixing up, you know. I like to keep with myself. If you get hurt once, you always feel that you will get hurt again. And I get hurt since I come down here with my family. And I don't want to mix up with nobody. Right, so you see the, the feelings that they, they brought with them in terms of coming back into this environment, that they, they felt that they were not going to be totally accepted. Um, this was Ms. Reddy, the first lady I knew. She, she's died past since then. Um, but she was very open, shared everything that she could share with me in terms of that interview. Very powerful interview. And they said, there are too many Barbarians who return here to see Barbados as more or less through the eyes that they left it and feel that they can return here and be the boss, or more or less. It is a 50-50 thing. Um, this was Eversley. So if you go into the market and you want a pound of tomatoes, and the lady says, okay, darling, there are 50 cents a pound. 
Do you hear 50 cents? I can't get a pound in here for, for that day. So the lady will say, well, get the back, I'll back to London. <laughs> Basically, you. <laughs> and, that, and that's what happens at times because they, they compare. And, and really, it's difficult to compare Barbados with London because the conditions are different. The cost of living is completely different. And therefore, you can't expect to have the same conditions that you meet in London and Barbados. And there's another quote. You want me to talk about them people again? I don't think them worthwhile talking about. Them is something else, bro. My return to Barbados is what I expect from England down here to Barbados. My return is a different return. Mine is I give them love, and I come down here, and they give me hatred. And I ain't talking no more about them at all, because them is only where's my blood pressure. I don't talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, you see the challenge that the people have. Then again, I used to visit all the time. He came in here, it must be about a dozen, dozen of times with them. Then I was glad to see you, and they're greeting you like that. Oh, before you unlock the suitcase, I buy around the suitcase to see what you bring for them. But now it is something else different. No suitcase, no one coming in the holler, so you know these people to think about it is something else for true. Don't know why. So, oh gosh, the same girl that I tell you was living here, she's now in America. So when they're out there, she want everything. Yeah, they send this for me. Right, like a fool would try and send it. Now she's in America now. Nobody can bother she. Because she make me very rough. So she mean nobody can bother she. She's, you see that? Ah, oh boy. I don't have to bother nobody anyway. Don't worry me. But it's true. And some things we have to give and take. Even one of my brothers said, one of the people that come from England mad, I say, you want a drink from me? My drink is mad. <laughs> I don't know what they say, why they have it in them that some people are. But people have to have sympathy for people like that. Some people went up there and had it hard, and had a hard time. So there might have been some people who actually came back with some mental challenges. Huh? Um, but we tended to then stereotype other people in the same way. And that, that was being unfair to the, to the returnees. And these are some of the, the, the statistics from the data that was collected from the questionnaires. And some of them said that, they, again, the push factors, some of them had experienced racism in employment, 48% had experienced racism in housing, 31% had experienced racism in church. This is before they came back, huh? And 48% indicated that their children had experienced racism. Again, push factors, 48% had reached retirement and had access to pensions. 70% had adequate incomes. 80% were able to own their own homes. 18% returned because the coal was affecting them. 15% indicated had achieved their goals. Some had went for five years. 80% had visited before and would have seen developments of the island and would have been attracted back. 3% knew of the concessions provided by government, 30% did not know of them. 44% benefited, 36% did not benefit. So there's some people who benefited from the concessions, some didn't because they, didn't, they weren't aware of them in the first place. So the marking of those concessions need to be done better. 50% had difficulty with customs. 40% knew of pension agreements, and 33% did not know. So there's some people who knew of the dual taxation pension arrangements, some did not know. 20% did not feel that they were accepted by Barbadians. 20% felt they were better trained than their Barbadian counterparts. 20% had difficulties with lawyers. 30% had difficulties with contractors. 70% left their children in the UK. The children visited from hold for holidays, but did not want to return to themselves as British. 87% agreed it was the right decision to return home. 67% um, were members of BARP. And that's interesting because a lot of them joined um, and reduced the benefits that they could have gotten. 90% maintained contact with other return nationals. Again, that's the clustering that within the, develop, the developments that they lived in. So they maintained those, those relationships in a very strong way. Huh? 70% said the family had accepted them back into the fold. So you, you had basically these, these persons who would have um, gone through this process of seeking to integrate and, and felt that they were, to some extent, still ostracized within the process and not being fully embraced back into Barbados. I believe that all the people who migrated, when they came back, they felt they were truly Barbadian. 
And I got that the sense of that. They felt they were truly Barbadian. And therefore, they were prepared to come back and work with Barbados to the best of their ability. They always talk about the fact that they sent back the remittances. There was one lady who had actually had the evidence that she sent back the remittances. She, she kept every counterfoil of every return that she sent to her family. So when she came back and the family said that she didn't send back the money, she was to pull out the counterfoil the, the, the and show them and say, these are what I sent to you, <laughs> right? And you sign for them. So, so she had the evidence. Um, but basically, they, they felt that they were, to some extent, entitled to come back and be reintegrated in the Barbian society. And they also felt that they had made significant contributions to Barbados and its development. Because if we look at the statistics in terms of the witnesses, in those early years, 10 million pounds might have been a very important amount of money for the economy of Barbados in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and whatever. Um, today it may not be that significant. But they're still making significant contributions because their pensions are coming back here. Um, basically, they, they're still finding ways to, to basically invest in Barbados in the ways that they can and make a contribution where they can. Some people um, form groups which donate to, to various institutions. Um, they donate to hospitals. They donate to uh, children's homes. Um, they have been making that sort of contribution. So I'm not sure why, why it is that we have not been able to accept them within the fold. Um, Gomez speaks about adaptation, readjustment, and reintegration as critical elements of this study. And the two perspectives of approach to this question would be the economic and social conditions of attorneys, whether or not they found jobs, adequate housing, developed personal relationships, and participate in community organizations. And to some extent, a lot of them did achieve these, this level of integration. Um, they basically, if they wanted to work, they would have found jobs, and some of them decided to work even when they retired and continued to be productive citizens. Um, they all, the majority had adequate housing because they were able to sell their homes in the UK and be able to buy properties here, and therefore we settled quite comfortably. Um, they had developed relationships, albeit with their colleagues from the UK in most instances, because the ones with the families in a lot of cases had broken down. And with the neighbors, basically, there were always challenges in terms of how they relate to those, those neighbors. And they found ways to participate in their own community organizations, All, albeit it was Barb in, in one case, and it was the other um, return national organizations that we're part of. Um, but they sought, to some extent, to, to build into that. The second perspective would be the migrant's own perception of his or her adjustment, the extent to which he or she feels the homeland has filled her self-defined needs and given her a sense of well-being. That is where really the question, question um, falls, basically, because a lot of them did not feel that they were accepted back as they thought they would have been. And that's a shame because I think there, there, there are families to some extent. They come from the same... Um, bosom that we have all come from. And therefore, we as a people have, to some extent, failed in embracing back our people who took the decision to make their own sacrifices to develop themselves and develop their families. And we all would do that. Those of who remain basically did not have to do it because we were given opportunities um, through um, free education and that sort of thing. And basically, we were able to raise to particular levels. And our economic development kind of moved pretty quickly in those periods. Um, because when you look back, you can have a fascination at the sort of economic growth we've had and development we've had over the last uh, 50 years or so. It is tremendous. Um, but these people would have struggled to some extent to make their own way. Um, but they reached a stage where they could actually come back and, and make another contribution to the society in which they, they feel that they're still part of. 87% of them agreed it was the right decision to return home. Even in the face of all the challenges that they were having. So what does that tell you? It means that they were committed to coming back to Barbados and committed to making a difference in terms of how they related with their, their country of origin. Um, so that, that is a very positive thing. There's one quote here which I, I thought was very poignant. 
Um, this is Fraser. He said, thank God I came back. For since I come back, came back, I feared all right. I go to the beach every morning, early. I get a little swim. I exercise on the beach. I know I will die someday, but I will die a happy person. So he has essentially very effectively reintegrated back into society. And he will survive in this society and not have the challenges that others may have because of the thing. Irrigation was never a response to the threat of losing wealth or status, but rather a achieving it. And because of this, the process was seen by the majority not as a permanent escape, but as a temporary withdrawal, with the intention of returning later to an improved material and social situation back home. So the whole movement away from Barbados was about trying to develop in a way which allow you to reach the level of status you wanted and achieve the level of wealth that you wanted. To some extent, they achieved that, right? And they were able to return, basically, to a material and social situation back home, which they felt would have been comfortable. But again, the attitudes of our own people might have frustrated that willingness to return and reintegrate into the Barbadian society. And it's something that we have to think about, about critically when we reflect on this. Was this achieved? The material may have been. The social is questionable. Clearly, there are trends which support the view that integration has been a challenge for some of the returnees. The challenges of family, contractors, absent siblings will create some unease and discomfort. Persons that brought with them good skills, knowledge, and experience from the UK. However, one does not get the sense that these have been exploited by the society or the returning. So those are where the weaknesses are. These are people who would have gained very valuable experiences over the years in the UK, who in some cases have developed themselves educationally, um, with the skills and whatever, and return with the expectations to be able to share this with the larger community. Did we embrace them? You can answer that for yourself. And this in itself may be a sign that they did not, they did not feel fully integrated. The research is still ongoing. And basically, this is part of a larger study. Um, basically, I'm working on a, a, a publication of Marcia Burroughs at this stage to actually put together all the voices and basically share that with the, the community. And this has been long in coming, but we're hoping to have it out by at least by the end of this year. Um, and it should be good reading because it has a lot more of the quotations that than what I have given you this afternoon as a, as a sample. And it really is a very rich source of information in terms of how our Barbadian brothers and sisters felt when they came back to Barbados after spending 40 or 50 years in the UK. I right, thank you. So we've come to the question and answer um, session for this evening. So there are microphones in the aisle. So if you have any questions, please use your microphones in the, in the aisles. And remember to keep your questions uh, as brief as possible so you can get in as many questions this evening. Very good. Beautiful presentation. I know we had a few... Uh, technical issues, but uh, it came out extremely well. Thank you. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of my wife. Unfortunately, she can't with, uh, come with us because uh, she has Alzheimer's now. But most of the things you said, you cover. And one thing, uh, just an interesting point. How many percentage, or have you ever got a percentage of how many females wanted to come back not the males. Who's the dominant factor? Is it the female or the male? Do you have that particular question? We don't have specific uh, statistics, but 
I think in the discussions, we recognized that the males were more eager to return home. Um, females came sometimes reluctantly, and then they sometimes returned to the UK. Um, but in, in majority of cases, the males tended to remain within, within Barbados. Right, okay. Um, so it is, I don't have the statistics, because we didn't necessarily inter interrogate that aspect of the, of the research. Um, but we can do that as an ongoing process. Yeah? Uh, some, well, 30-odd 30, 30 years ago, in fact, about 37 years ago, when uh, I proposed to my wife, she said to me, I'm married under one condition, I want to return back to Barbados. Mm -hmm. And that happened, what, 20 years later. Okay. But the other question, yeah, quite right. Um, when, in the early days, when people came in to uh, England in particular, uh, accommodation was really poor. They had the Winterford Atwells and people like that, which opened the uh, accommodation up. And then when uh, Mr. Harold Wilson got in, he gave public housing. But prior to that, a lot of the people were partners, or uh, susus, as we call it. Mm. And they would do a susu, and there would be a family in one room and a family in this room. That money would come together, and one of those people would buy a house or have a deposit to put down on the house. Mm. And the susu would carry on, and, and before you know, within about four years, everyone's got a... a the deposit and they put it on uh, into a house and then those people who would go into those houses would take in other families which would help to pay the mortgage mm. and this was the uh, the system and then uh, Mr. Harold Wilson came in made it much easier for social housing and a lot of people uh, went social housing way mm. a lot of those people didn't return back the people who actually went in the Susu started buying property moved from this particular area, gone into a higher area, and then gone, uh, finally ended up in an expensive area. Mm. When they retired, they could come back here. They could, if they had bought a piece of land, like you said, in uh, St. James, St. Philip, those areas, they could buy and build. Mm. Or a lot of them came to a particular point because they was uh, forward, there was good tradesmen, and that. they was earning good money they could earn money to buy the land before they started, and when they came here, they only had to think about building a house, mm. and this is the thing. But thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. And if I fully agree, because a number of people um, were able to move on as they acquired more and more properties. In fact, the Jamaicans um, had a, a policy of investing in housing and rent it to the Barbadians to some extent. So, um, so that also existed in the, the UK time. Yeah? Yes, sir. Yes, thank you very much uh, for an excellent presentation. There's a couple of questions I want to ask and some observation because your presentation is my life's experience. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. My name is Badilaria. Okay. Yeah. And the first Society for the Resettlement of Caribbean Nationals is the first organization that was established to look at nationals coming back. That's why it did not speak specifically of Barbadians mm. because all Caribbean nationals had the same experience. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. You, but when we speak about Barbados, you mention in your presentation that those that went to England included bus drivers, conductors, train drivers. Now I'd like you to, re to reflect on that because my experience and the research I have done, I do have never met one person who left Barbados as a bus driver or a train driver. All of us went to and the age of 20 or so, your driving license was not respected in England. Mm. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And we didn't have no drivers of trains in Barbados, mm. so you don't see how they're going to recruit you to go to England to be a bus a train driver. 
So I would ask you to revise that because what people might have done is got mixed up with what they have achieved oh, with what as they opposed to what it started as. Started as, yeah. right. So that, that's very, very important. Mm -hmm. because it, it, now what I would like you to do, because all that you have said there, as I said, is part of my experience. At the moment, because of the WinRest generation apology and reparation, there are a number of people in Barbados who do not get pension, but because of the reparation scheme that has now reached uh, 570 million pounds have been set up for the compensation scheme, mm. those people are entitled to their pension. They left England before. They have a pension. Yes. Mm. And what is also planned is that those who, these are people who do not have British citizenship. Mm. Those, there's some people who has, who have a, uh, Pension, they get their pension, but they do not have British citizenship. Mm. If they don't be careful, the cutoff is going to come where you will only get a pension if you have British citizenship. And that's why it's now offered as part of the compensation scheme. Mm. That if you apply for your British citizenship, once you have lived in England for those periods, you will get it, and it wouldn't cost you anything. Mm -hmm. It's a sort of... So I would hope that in your research and this series that you call on the government. I've already written to the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs sending up people's names who have no British citizenship, some getting pension, and right. some are not getting pension. So I thank you very much for your presentation, mm -hmm. and I hope that the book will soon be ready yeah. because there's a lot going on at the moment with regards to the matter. Mm -hmm. I myself, I have a case against the British health authorities for the key policy of the Windward Generation scandal. My case is in the British High Court for 40 years. Your case has been there for 40 years? Eh? It has been there for 40 years? That's right. Darn. From 1978. <laughs> to this note, 1961. Yeah. Barbados, isn't it? Eh? <laughs> anyway, and, and the, the one question I would ask you yeah. uh -huh. is, or oh, another question, is, the interviews you have done, have you had any research on any white people that have left Barbados that you have interviewed who have lived and returned? Um, we had, I think there were two people, um, Roy Marshall. So Roy Marshall, he was, he was interviewed. Um, he came back and he uh, eventually became the Chancellor University of West Indies. But he moved to, Mo to Jamaica, basically. So he wasn't living here for, for a long time. But I interviewed him when he retired here, um, basically. And there was another lady, I can't remember the name of her. Um, but she, she didn't appear to be pure white, more high brown. Um, but we didn't have any whites, per se. That's, what, that's the point I'm right yeah. If any of the people who migrated because of mm. the condition, yeah. if any of them was white? Not from the, the interviews that we did. Okay, thank you very they much. It might have been, but we didn't capture any in that process. It seemed everybody was happy. <laughs> Guy. Again, Ken, let me echo everybody else's thanks for your presentation tonight. A question. Um, you mentioned the fact that a significant number um, of persons didn't know about the concessions on coming back to Barbados 
Um, and it goes to the, the, the body of the study. Mm -hmm. How can we better improve that communication with our diaspora? And how can we make them feel, as you said, 87% were pleased that they came back to Barbados, but how can we facilitate that transition? And I ask that question, having just re returned from the UK and, and trying to think for those still there, mm -hmm. how can we facilitate that recognizing that, as you said, remittances are significant, even now in our economic situation. Um, what more could possibly be done? From your research, have you all been able to identify how structurally we could try to make people's return and their mm. assimilation or resettlement to Barbados easier? Mm. So. Yeah, um, the question of communication is also always very critical. Huh? I think we might have fell down in the early stages when those um, concessions were provided, that we didn't communicate more widely uh, with the diaspora at, this, at that point in time. And therefore, a lot of people missed the opportunity to actually benefit from, from those remittances, from those concessions, sorry. In terms of the improvement of the situation, I think a number of the, the returns themselves had indicated that they would like to be able to participate more in what is happening within the, the society itself. Whether it's, it's through committees, whether it's through um, agencies which are set up to deal with particular issues. Um, they would like to be able to share a lot more. I remember we had at least two des diaspora conferences here um, in the last couple of years. Lenny Marcy and I did an um, exhibition at one of them at Sherburn. And there were people coming around being very interested in what, what we had to, to show in those exhibitions. And they were very enthused with the fact that we were actually doing some work to educate Barbarians about what the experience was for people who had migrated. Uh, because there's a level of ignorance, basically, in terms of how people perceive the experience of these people and how they perceive their behaviors when they return. And I think we have to maybe spend a little more time seeking to broaden the information in terms of what the expectations are, but also allowing them greater participation in some of the activities that we're involved in. Um, but it also means that they also have to make the effort to get more involved in some things and integrate more within the society as opposed to separating themselves to some extent in their, their various uh, pockets. Um, so it's a, it's a dual process, but I think we as a people have to be more accepting as well that there are um, diversities in terms of how people are within um, any society. And when people have different experiences, they will obviously exhibit different behaviors. And we have to accept that that is part of what the experience of migration will throw up for us. Um, we couldn't understand, you know, why the Guyanese were living in all these people in one room and that sort of thing. But that has, that has been the experience of all people who went to the UK. And the more we share this information, the more I think people become aware of basically what the challenges they're facing and how they can help to allow them to integrate more effectively within our societies. Yeah? Excuse me, uh, the High Commission in London was extremely helpful when... When Guy was there? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, not when Guy was there. Uh, <laughs> this was a few years back. But the information actually does filter down through the Barbadian Association, the Afro-Caribbean Associations, a lot of the information does filter down that way. Uh -huh. uh, if anybody's returning, if they've got savvy about them, they would either ask a friend and you'd get the answer. Mm. Uh, what a lot of people don't do, they assume what they got on airsay. They don't ring up the High Commission That's and get the latest report. I mean, when we first came out, uh, just prior to before we first came out, uh, the wife and the husband could have a car and bring two cars back. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then they found out that was getting a little bit of abuse. <laughs> yeah. uh, so he was only allowed one car back. But I mean, uh, uh, most of the things, all, even now, the Northern Group of Associate of Returning Nationals. Now, we still get a lot of people will come along to us and say, oh, what's the best way of this? And especially getting things out of the port. Uh, that is the difficulty. That is where the problem really happens. When you 
you, you, you pay your money to ship the stuff over here, it arrives to the port. Now you've got to pay from the port to your home, then you've got to have unstuffing charges, then you've got to, uh, for some unknown reason, customer offices only can work overtime, they can't do it in the day, they have to so work overtime, okay. <laughs> uh, and all these things. And uh, oh, we don't know how, what you've actually bought back, but give us $2,000, and then if there's, uh, uh, at the end of that, if you owe us any money, we'll ask you for it. Mm. You try and get the two thousand dollars back. That's difficult. Yes, yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. No, we, we have to find ways of streamlining that process more efficiently because it has caused people a number of, of problems over the years. Um, but I think basically the good customs officers tend to assist those persons because there are extracts we had from people who were saying that they were treated well by the customs as well. Um, so it isn't all a horror story for everybody. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So I think we can all agree that um, Mr. Walters sort of illustrated um, quite well the experiences of returning nationals to Barbados, and we're all looking forward to that publication um, in the future. So ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of tonight's proceedings. Um, I would like to thank you for coming to tonight's lecture and invite you to return next week when we have a panel discussion entitled Betrayal, Changing Immigration Policy in the Age of Brexit featuring Reverend Guy Hewitt, Professor Pedro Welch, Mr. Winston Stanford, anyone with the name Winston has to be a good person, um, and Mr. Ruben Rollock. Um, I'll also like to remind you to make contact with the assistant creator for social history, Natalie uh, McGuire, if they would like to share their immigration experiences and stories. Natalie will be available on lecture evenings from 4 p.m., or they can book appointments with her for other times. So please join me for some refreshments afterwards and we can continue to share these stories. Have a good night. <laughs>